Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for staying around till the bitter end. Uh, I hope you've had a, a, just a ton of interesting things today and learned so much. Um, thank you for the PetCon Canada team for inviting me to be here. I'm really excited to share with you my story about the very first time I wrote it. All right, let's not kid ourselves. The first and only time I have written an algorithm to invest in the market. And <laughs> before I do that, oops, we need to do something. So I'm. Thank you. Excellent. So this is technically about building a quantitative trading strategy to beat the S&P 500. And before I dive into my story and my experience, I want to tell you a little bit about myself and why I embarked on this project. So I, as Peter mentioned, I'm the VP of product at a company called Quantopian. And Quantopian has a mission to become the world's first crowdsourced hedge fund. So we have a free online platform that lets you research, develop, and trade any algorithms you can write to invest in the market. It's all Python. And all our users use it to do exactly that. And we want to pick the best of those and work with the writers to invest in them as a crowdsourced hedge fund. But I'm a product manager, and my, I have a degree in computer science, but I have never programmed professionally. And I've spent my career developing software with engineers. I've developed marketing software and uh, commerce software and content publishing software. I've done a lot of work with big media companies down in New York. But I have never built software for quants. I have never built software for people who invest in the market, or for people who work with the market, or for anybody in the world of finance, for that matter. So when I took the job as a VP of product at Quantopian, one of the first things I needed to do was write an algorithm to invest in the market. And I needed to do this to understand what my users were doing so that I could build effective software for them. And so I brushed up my very rusty Python chops and dove right in. And the first thing that I actually, the first thing that I did was, at that time, a company I had previously worked for was IPOing. This was late last year. And somebody said to me, this is great. The United States has just gone from the House and the Senate from Democrats to Republicans. The economy in the US does better when there are Republicans in the office. This is going to work out wonderful for you by the time the lockup expires. The economy is going to be booming. Your shares are going to be worth a million dollars. That did not happen. But they, uh, they told me that, and I wanted to go see if that was true. And I was like, well, I've got this platform that has all this historical market data. I can get information about when the United States government has shifted from Democratic to Republican in the past and see what happened in the market and if that would help, if that would tell me anything about what was going to happen. Turns out in, we have uh, Quantopian's platform has 12 or 13 years of historical data now, so pricing data on the US market for 13 years. Turns out in that time period, the United States government has only turned over like eight times, seven times. And so while there was something there, there was nothing I could tell conclusively. So I kind of moved on. Then I thought, maybe there's something to look at, how the economy reflects these giant events that pull the world together. Things like the Olympics or the World Cup or those types of things. There still were not enough events for that to be interesting. And then Credit Suisse released their Gender 3000 report. Now, the Credit Suisse Gender 3000 report is a study that they do where they look at uh, 3,000, what was it? I'm sorry, my numbers are getting messed up. Um, they look at 3,000 companies across 40 countries. And they look at how gender is reflected in those organizations. And so they do a big survey, and they get all sorts of information. And in that, they showed that 12.9% of top management in these companies are women. And 12.7% of the boards have a woman on them. Now, these numbers are not great, but they're also not surprising. All right, unless you've been living under a rock, you're probably aware that there's a large conversation going on right now about women in positions of leadership at companies. The charts that I thought were a little bit more exciting were this one, which took a look at global performance of companies that had a sizable market cap. And the gray line there is companies with a female on their board of directors, and the blue line is companies without. Well, that's pretty interesting. This one takes a look at companies by percentage of their management team that are women. So the purple line there is 50%, the gray line is 33%, the blue line is 25%, and the green line is all companies. And so this led me to the question of, what if you invested in female CEOs? So could I build a strategy that very simply looked at female CEOs historically, bought when they took over the position, and then sold when they were no longer the CEO? This seemed simple enough. My newbie, you know, relearning Python could figure out how to do this. That's where I was going to start. And so 
The very first thing I had to do now, all right, step back. This is all done in IPython. I'm not presenting it in the notebook because I have found that many people in the audiences can never see what you present in IPython. Although these projectors here, I've seen it done very well today. I am using slides. However, with that said, all of my notebooks are shared, and I'll give the URL at the end. So if you want to dive into any of this, it is all there for you. Um, but the first thing I needed to do is go get a list of historical female CEOs. Now, I couldn't just get the list of current day female CEOs. Because what I want to look at is a historical simulation of what happened if I did this over time. And if I only looked at the companies with CEOs today, I would have bias in my simulation. So I needed to get a historical list of all the female CEOs that there had been within some subset. So I did, I think, what any good person embarking on a new project does. I turned to Google. And I Googled historical female CEOs. And lo and behold, it was actually pretty easy. A Catalyst is a nonprofit focused on providing women with positions uh, in business, leading positions in business. And they come out annually with a report that lists all of the companies in the Fortune 1000 and which ones have female CEOs specifically. And the report goes back 15 or 20 years. So I got that report. It was a PDF. I manually got from PDF to Excel, getting the names and companies of all of the CEOs that had been that were female CEOs in the Fortune 1000 from 2002, that's when my data starts for pricing data, until the end of 2014 when I was working on this. And then I needed to get some information about those people. In order to do, do the study that I talked about, I needed the start date, when they started, and I needed the end date, and I needed the ticker symbol. I think I probably spent 25 or 30% of the early work on this project just getting and cleansing that data. I think anybody that's done work in data understands that problem. What a pain. And I first went through and analyzed all the CEOs manually. I thought it was actually, I thought it'd be a lot easier to find the start and end dates. It was quite challenging. I was basically stalking them on the internet, searching LinkedIn profiles and Bloomberg resumes and all sorts of stuff to figure out when they started and ending the position. Then I did the best I could to get the start and end dates and the ticker symbols. Then I actually went to Mechanical Turk and I had two different groups of Mechanical Turks go through the whole list to do the same analysis so that I had at least three data points for every CEO and where there were differences and discrepancies, I dug into those more. So that was how I got the list that you see up there. Once I pulled this into my IPython environment and started running it through some data to see what the pricing data looked like, I realized that there were other problems. CEOs aren't like you and I. They don't start their new job two weeks after they quit their last job on the next convenient Monday. They start on the first of the month, or the first of the year, or the first of the quarter. And often those days are Saturdays, or Sundays, or holidays, or not trading days. So I had to cleanse all the data points to make sure that they were actually trading days. Then, the other thing is ticker symbols are not, they're not unique. They're used over and over again. So the ticker symbol Q means one thing in 2003, and it means an entirely different thing in 2013. Because one company can change their ticker symbol for marketing reasons, or go out of business, or whatever, and another company scoops that ticker symbol up and keeps using it. And so you have to do a bunch of work to make sure you've got the right pricing data for the right company. I did all of that cleansing. And at the end of it, what I had was 80 female CEOs across 74 companies over a 12-year period. Now, I've shared this study on the internet. And I regularly get the comment that my sample size is too small, which is true, but it is also a reality of what I have to work with. So I continue to push forward. Uh, I do think we could use more female CEOs to even these out and make the numbers more interesting, but it is what it is. When I look at that, uh, taking a look at plotting it just to understand how many new female CEOs there are per year, uh, the chart looks like this. You'll see the date down here starts before 2002, which I've said is the beginning of my simulation, because I also took CEOs that started prior to 2002, and, but were still CEOs in 2002. And I just bought on the first day of my simulation, which was January 2nd, 2002. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to look at this this way was I was a little bit worried that if the majority of the female CEOs were CEOs after 2008, that the results would be skewed because the market's been doing very well since 2008. And so if there were only in that time period the majority of my female CEOs, would my results look great but not actually mean anything? So I looked at this and I said, well, that's very interesting, but I have absolutely no idea if this tells me anything. So I will continue moving on with my study. I also looked at how many companies will I hold each year as I push forward with my simulation. So this was knowing that I'm buying on the start date, Selling on the end date, how does this grow in terms of my portfolio size? 
And you'll see at the beginning here in 2002, over the course of 2002, I hold about 14 companies. And by the end of the simulation, which is 2014, I've got almost 50 companies that have female CEOs. So the overall number in my portfolio, because I hold them for the duration of their tenure as CEO, grows. This is going to become important in one of the examples I'll show you later, so re remember this chart. So then I want to just talk a little bit about what my simulation does. What this is, is it's called a back test in algorithmic trading. And it starts at the very beginning of time, which in my case is January 2002, which is when I have US equity minutely pricing data. So in our data set, we have the pricing data for every single minute of the market for every ticker symbol that traded on the US equity market at that time. And I have that all the way through the end of 2014. I have it till the present day, but I stopped my simulation as 2014 because that's what my data set was. Um, hopefully Catalyst will release a new data, new data at the end of this year and I'll be able to update it. And what that back test does is it goes through history and simulates my strategy as if it were trading in the actual market. So on any given day, it asks a couple of questions. First, it looks at my list of female CEOs and it says, did anybody start today as CEO? And if the answer is yes, in this first version of my algorithm, it buys 500 shares. Then it says, did any CEOs end their position today? And if the answer is yes, it sells everything I own of that company. And then it moves on to the next day. And my back test marches on through history, making buy and sell decisions for me, showing me what would have happened had I traded this strategy in reality, if I had known what I knew now then. This is the code. Again, this is all shared. I'm not going to go through it line by line. But uh, this was the first version of my algorithm. And you can all go look at it if you would like. Um, I'm sure it's a lot of spaghetti code because it was me figuring it out. And every time my engineers look at this with me, they're like, oh my god, Karen, why were you doing that? But it works. <laughs> This is what my strategy looks like when it finally ran that first time. The returns are 511%, and I'm not going to lie. I had one of those moments when you're programming. It was like 6.15 in the evening. I ran it, and it actually ran. It didn't have a bug. It didn't have an error. It ran all the way to completion. I like, threw my hands in the air. I said, it goes up and to the right. Peace out. I'm going home. I will see you later. And I like walked off. Mic drop. Went home. And it was like 3 a.m. in the morning when I woke up, and I was like, wait. Who cares? I'm not comparing this to anything. This tells me nothing. I don't know if this is good. I don't know if this is bad. As I mentioned, the market from 2008 to today goes up and to the right. So does my strategy. So this, I mean, this could mean absolutely nothing. So I came back in that next day, a little bit more humble, and I decided to compare it to a benchmark. And the benchmark, the benchmark that is a standard benchmark is the S&P 500. We will also talk about that in a minute. When I throw this against the S&P 500, this is what my first version of my algorithm looks like against the S&P 500. 511% uh, returns. S&P 500 over the same time period is 122%. Don't take a picture of this one yet. I'll tell you why in a minute. And the difference <laughs> is 318%. Uh, so again, I feel pretty spectacular. I'm looking at my data. I'm feeling like I've done a really good job. And then I sit down with Justin, who's our resident quant. And Justin has actually started a hedge fund. He has worked as a hedge fund. He has written algorithms to invest in the market. And I'm walking him through my strategy and what I did because I'm feeling like maybe I should quit my job and become a quant and write strategies to invest in the market. And he says to me, Karen, what's your leverage? And I said, my what? Anybody know what leverage is? So leverage when you're doing a strategy like this is when you borrow money from your broker in order to continue trading your strategy. And it's really common in the world of hedge funds for you to have some amount of money, let's call it $100,000, and for you to have the ability to lever that up to three times. So instead of trading $100,000, you're trading $300,000, 200,000 of which you've borrowed from your broker and you're paying interest on. What this chart shows with my leverage is my algorithm is plugging right along, right along, 2008 hits, I borrow 400 times, I lose 300 times, I then borrow 800 times, I lose 600 times. <laughs> That would never actually work in reality. <laughs> a, nobody would lend you 800 times your portfolio amount and then let you lose it and continue lending you more money. <laughs> this happened because, if you recall in that first algorithm, I invested, I bought 500 shares of any, every company without any regard for how expensive the company was, whether or not there's enough volume for me to be able to buy that, how much money I had in my portfolio, and so Justin very kindly explained leverage to me and then helped me rewrite my strategy to do a better job. The new version of my strategy 
does the same back test, marches on through history, except this time, each day it says, did any female CEOs start today? And if the answer is yes, it puts them on a buy list. It then finds out, did any CEOs end today? And if the answer is yes, it puts them on a sell list. And then it rebalances my portfolio. And what it does here is it says, OK, how much money do I have today? And at the beginning of my simulation, that's $100,000. But as I gain and lose money, that value adjusts. And so it says, what's the value of my portfolio today? I get that value. It then says, how many companies are on my buy list, uh, which is actually the companies coming in, plus any companies I'm still holding. So it's buy, uh, sell minus buy, or portfolio minus sell, in any case. Um, and it says, how many companies do I want to hold? Divides my portfolio by the number of companies in the portfolio value by the number of companies in the portfolio, and then goes about investing exactly that amount in each company. So every single time I make a decision to buy and sell, I'm changing the amount of money in companies that I currently hold so that I have an equal weighted portfolio across all of the companies in my portfolio. Let's make sure if I've lost money, say my strategy has lost money and I've gone from $100,000 down to $80,000, it says, okay, now I only have $80,000 to invest across these companies. Let's rebalance the strategy to make sure that I'm not losing more money or having to borrow money in order to make my buys in the future. When I do that, and then it moves on to the next day and does the same thing. So every single time it's making a buy or sell decision, it rebalances every company within my portfolio. When I do this, here's the new code. It's a lot longer. There's a lot more thought there. When I do this, this is what my strategy looks like. My algorithm now returns 339% for an outperformance of the S&P 500 of 217. You can take a picture of this one. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually, these numbers hold up. and. Uh, so it outperforms it pretty significantly. It takes it down from like 500% returns to 339% returns. Still nothing to snuff at. Uh, you can see that the, the S&P 500 looks a lot more jaggedy right now as opposed to smooth because those differences aren't so high. Uh, but this, is what my this becomes my really interesting strategy at this point. Justin takes another look at it. He says, you didn't screw up this time, Karen. Good job. Uh, this is what my leverage looks like. So you'll see it goes from zero, which is what it is here. On the first day, it shoots up because I make a whole bunch of purchases. One basically indicates that I am not levered. So it, leverage of one means I'm investing my portfolio. And you can see it, it jumps around a little bit as there's gains and losses in my portfolio and I make those rebalances. But it stays around one, which is pretty much what I wanted to do in the course of my algorithm. So that's pretty exciting. Now I've got a strategy that's actually feasible. Then I put it on the internet. I shared it with our community. Uh, it went on to you know, Reddit and Hacker News and all those fun places, and I got lots of feedback. Uh, one of the common questions was, is this just Yahoo and Alibaba? Does anybody know why this might be Yahoo and Alibaba? Melissa Myers, or the, Melissa Mayers, owns as the CEO of Yahoo, and <laughs> Yahoo has shares in Alibaba. That's absolutely correct. So Yahoo actually has two of my female CEOs, our Yahoo CEOs. Carol Bartz, this is when she started as CEO, this is when she ended, then an interim CEO, I think, for a little while, then Marissa comes in, and this is what Yahoo's done since Marissa came in. Now, we could look at this and think Marissa is just exceptional. I'm not going to discount that in any way, but what has actually had a large impact on the Yahoo shot is exactly what this gentleman said here. Alibaba IPO'd during this time period, and Alibaba had a massive IPO, and Yahoo had made an early investment in Alibaba. And everybody knew this. This was publicly disclosed. And as Alibaba's stock price went up and up and up, Yahoo's stock price did the same. And so the question here is, you're holding Yahoo, obviously. Is your strategy just getting these outside returns because you're holding Yahoo and it's responding to that? It's a very good question. Uh, lucky for me, in my little IPython notebook, it's you know, two lines of code. I remove Yahoo from my strategy, and we take a look at what it looks like. This is the results. Um, it comes down to 320% for an 197% outcome. And this goes back to that first chart I showed you of how many stocks I own at any given point in my portfolio. See, when Marissa's the CEO, which comes in over here somewhere, I'm holding 40 to 50 stocks at any given point in time. And because I've got that equal weighted portfolio, my, what I own in Yahoo is only 140th or 150th of my portfolio. So while it impacts the overall returns, it is not the cause of the overall returns. And this started, this was the first of a whole bunch of experiments that I did to try and understand why my results looked so good. Because one of the things as a quant you're always trying to do is disprove yourself. 
We always want to know, if I'm going to put my own money into this, what am I not seeing? What's wrong here? What did I not get? And so the next question that came up is, is this sector bias? This is the idea that in a portfolio, you could be overweighted in one sector. And so we've got Morningstar Fundamentals data, which is the information that comes off a company's 10Ks and 10Qs, the filings that they do with the SEC every quarter. And it's like 600 data points per company. One of the things it includes is a sector code, a sector identifier. So I took the 80 companies and I divided them up by sector, and that's what this looks like here. So this is all the companies, and I'm sorry, it's very small font. These two here, this big tall one and this one next to it, are consumer cyclical and consumer defensive, two of Morningstar sectors. That's 30% of my portfolio. So the idea here is if the consumer sector did really well during the same time period, the reality is I'm not, um, what I'm seeing is just the consumer sector outperforming and I could just invest in some consumer sector ETF and that would be the same. So what I do for this is a little bit more complicated. Remember I was doing what I, what's called an equal weighted portfolio where every company has the same amount invested in it. What I wanna create next is a sector neutral portfolio, which means instead of having the same amount of money invested per company, I have the same amount of money invested per sector. So when I go to do that rebalance, I take the total amount of money in my portfolio, I then look at how many sectors are reflected in my portfolio at that given time. And early on in my algorithm, when there are only 14 companies there, it could be three or four sectors, and later it could be all 11 or 13, I think. And so I take it and I look at how many sectors are in my portfolio, I then divide the portfolio amount by that number of sectors, and then for every company I wanna buy, I look at it and I say, which sector are you in? How many companies are in that sector? How much is allocated to the sector? Divide it by the number of companies in the sector, and that's what I invest in that company. So healthcare over here, which has three companies, the amount allocated to that sector would be divided in thirds, and each company would get one third of that amount, whereas the consumer cyclical sector here, which has 20 or something, they would each get 1 20th of the total amount to that sector. So every sector has the same amount of money invested in it, but the companies within the sector have very different amounts. When I do that, my returns look like this, 275% for a 153% difference. So it does impact it. The consumer sector is actually doing very well, and, uh, uh, but it's still not the entire reason for why my portfolio is still looking pretty good. The next thing that I hear all the time, I still hear this, even as I do more work on this and I publish the continued work, everybody says, your benchmark's wrong. It's great. You're outperforming the S&P 500 by 300%. Good for you. It doesn't mean anything because your benchmark is wrong. It's a, it's a very philosophical question in the world of finance. The S&P 500 is used to measure everything. So your mutual funds in your 401k, they're judged against the S&P 500. Hedge funds are judged against the S&P 500. It is the benchmark of choice for the world of finance. It's supposed to represent the US economy, large cap companies, and how they're doing. There are some hand-wavy metrics which are used to determine who gets into the S&P 500. It's the 500 largest companies. So they use market cap and they use liquidity and then a group of people get together and they decide who should be in the S&P 500 and who shouldn't be in the S&P 500. And there's a whole series of strategies for investments that are based around knowing when a company is going to get added or removed from the S&P 500 and trading based on that. Because you get into the S&P 500 and it's like you're part of the club, your stock price goes up. In any case, the S&P 500, I learned, is not equal weighted like my strategy. Remember, my strategy does, the first strategy, or the second strategy, does an equal amount in each company. The S&P 500 is what's called market cap weighted. So the biggest companies have the most invested in it, and each smaller company has a little bit less invested in it as they go down. So the theory here is, look, these are just different, different weighting schemes for these portfolios, so you can't really use them to compare to each other. So it took, it was like 10 months of this having been out on the internet when someone finally said to me, the one you want is the RSP Guggenheim Equal Weighted S&P 500 Index. Guggenheim takes uh, all of the companies in the S&P 500, and instead of doing a market cap weighted portfolio, it does an equal weighted one, and that's what this is. So you'll see here, I'm looking at my algorithm, returns 339% over that 12-year period. Now, I've returned to the equal weighted strategy here, not the sector neutral strategy. The RSP, which is the equal weighted S&P 500, returns 251%, or the S&P 500 returns 122%. So looking at the equal weighted S&P 500 benchmark does pull in those numbers quite a bit more closely. 
But still, the female CEOs of the Fortune 500 outperform that benchmark. So that's interesting. The next thing is, well, this, is this the right benchmark? Remember, we're talking about the female CEOs of the Fortune 1000. So wouldn't the right benchmark actually be the Fortune 1000? If we're looking and asking the question of what happens if you invest in female CEOs, don't you want to say, well, if we're looking at the Fortune 1000, let's look at the Fortune 1000 without those CEOs and see how that looks. That's actually more cha uh, challenging than you would think. Fortune makes money by selling the lists of the constituents of the Fortune 1000. So if I want 13 years or 12 years of historical Fortune 1000 constituents lists so I can stitch together an algorithm that invests in all of those, I'm paying thousands and thousands of dollars to get that list to do the comparison. For my little side project, that was not going to happen. So what actually, this, in some ways this algorithm as a product manager, it's the gift that keeps on giving because I had done a whole bunch of work on this. It was the spring, I put it aside. I went heads down on building a new API for our users and it was, it was, I mean, it was maybe six weeks ago, I popped up and I was like, wait, this new API lets me answer this question. Um, we've built an API that lets you take all the companies in the market on any given day. It's about 8,000 companies, plus or minus a few, and rank them based on any factor, and then pick which ones you want to invest in. So I built a strategy, a second one, that takes a look at all the companies, ranks them by revenue because the Fortune 1000 is the top 1,000 companies by revenue, and then it just takes those top 1,000 companies and it invests in those, and it rebalances that every month, and it's equal weighted. So in theory, this is the best, the best benchmark I could do because it's the Fortune 1000 as compared to my strategy. That looks about right. So when we take that, my algorithm, I call this the Quanto 1000 because it's not Fortune. They won't give me their lists. <laughs> Um, my algorithm returns 339%, the Quanto 1000 returns 296%, the S&P 500 returns 122%. So this is, you know, it's a 43% difference between these two, that's still sizable. If you want to give me 43% returns on my money year over year, I would happily take that. Um, so, but it is much, like we're getting closer to an answer about why this is the way that it is. There's something interesting about these companies that are having very good revenue, very good market cap, that makes sense. My females, they still beat out the Fortune 1000 at the end of the day. So then the question for me is, well, what if I don't look at the Fortune 1000? What if I look at all companies? And the reason I started with the Fortune 1000 was because that was the data set I could get. Uh, and then also, the gift that keeps on giving, um, we've integrated all these new data sets in the last year that I had sort of been ignoring. And about six weeks ago, I also realized we have a new data set from Eventvestor called CEO Changes. And this is a spectacular data set. This actually has 3,815 CEO changes from 2007 to today. And a CEO changes when anybody leaves their position or comes into their position, and it includes gender. That's one of the hardest things. And so I not only have all of the female CEOs coming into or leaving any position, I have all the male CEOs as well. And so what I can do now is create comparative strategies of men versus women to see how that actually looks. It's a shorter time period. It's from 2007 till today. But within that time period, I've got 143 incoming female CEOs, and I've got 86 outgoing female CEOs. So if you remember, compare that to my number earlier of 80 female CEOs, this is a much larger sample size. Now, I cannot take credit for the next work you're going to see. We had a spectacular intern this summer, James Christopher, who uh, actually had spent a whole bunch of time digging into this data set to try and understand it based on my previous work on this question. And so he, has, he pulled this stuff together. Um, the other thing that's really interesting about this data set, it, is, it doesn't just include their start date, it includes the date their position was announced, it includes the date that information became tradable, because they could announce it on Friday at 5 p.m., and then it's not tradable till the following Monday, and it includes the date that it became effective, meaning the date the CEO went into the position. This chart shows a strategy that invests in female CEOs on the date that they went, uh, became effective, so actually went into the position and, and stopping the investment on the date they leave the position, as compared to a similar strategy looking at just male CEOs. That's interesting, right? These numbers are very different than what we have seen before. So the female CEOs returns 28% over this seven year period and the male CEOs returns 44%. Now, reality, if you look at that chart, they look like they end almost exactly the same. There's a pretty big dip right here in the last two days on the female CEOs, which is what accounts for the big difference there. But this is really fascinating. These are all CEO changes over a seven year period. And that looks very different than what we were seeing before. 
We then took a look at it where we were buying on the announcement and selling on the day it became effective. And what James was able to find is that there was a 20-day window there after a female CEO was announced that you could arbitrage the bad news that a company was putting a female in the position and make a bunch of money because the stock price goes down on the announcement. And then it pops right back up as people maybe realize they're being irrational. <laughs> there might be a bit of speculation on my part there. <laughs> in any case, even with this, the female CEOs are returning 68% and the male CEOs are returning 47%. So not the returns that we were seeing from my well, here's the, this one I include the S&P 500, where the female CEOs in the S&P 500 end at almost exactly the same place. And here's with my female CEOs, Fortune 1000, over that same time period. Um, so this returns number is going to be different, because remember, this is just 2007 to today. But here, the Fortune 1000 female CEOs are returning 187%, which is still pretty significant outperformance of these other portfolios. So <laughs> where does that leave us? <laughs> This has been a great project. I've been working on it for about a year. And there are so many times when I feel like this during the course of it. And I'm sure you can all relate to that in your own various projects that you've worked on. What is this data telling me? I would love to stand up here and tell you that female CEOs are outperforming their male counterparts. I'm completely biased. Like, I will not hide that from you. I don't think the data shows that yet. I think there's something really interesting about this idea of female CEOs at the Fortune 1000 companies or companies with high revenue, high market cap, as compared to the male counterparts in those similar companies. But I'm not, I haven't done the work yet to narrow down that specifically, and that's where I head next. So I'm going to try and combine that event investor data with the Morningstar data. And you guys all know how much fun it is to pull multiple data sets together and do a strategy looking at the different levers there to see if I can't find something interesting. But if I've intrigued any of you, everything I've done is available here at quantopian.com slash female CEOs. Uh, it's all done in IPython. All of the data is there for you to use. And you can take this and extend it. Or maybe you have a different event study that would be more interesting based on something that you study in your own world. Because really, that's what this is about. It's about giving people the tools and the data to be able to do this type of analysis on whatever they're interested in. Because in the world of Wall Street, all of this information, all of this data, these tools to do this have been locked within hedge funds. And we want to change that. We want to make it so that anyone, anywhere, can answer these questions. And Quantopian, it's at the intersection of two industries, finance and technology, that are woefully lacking in female participation. And so I get up here, and I show this stuff because I want to invite more women to Quantopian. I think that diversity is really important in what we're doing. If we want to be a better hedge fund than all the hedge funds that are out there, we need diversity. And there's some ways we do really well on that. We have 55,000 community members in our community that are building algorithms together and sharing them and working together. 50% of them are not in the United States. Go Canada. Lots of strong representation there. 65% uh, of them are not working in the world of finance. So it's a lot of people like yourselves, engineers, PhDs, doing really interesting things and bringing that diversity, ideas like investing in female CEOs, like I did because I'm not a quant and I don't do statistical arbitrage on different sectors and that kind of stuff. And there's opportunity there for a really interesting diverse fund to come about. But when we change Wall Street, and I personally believe we're going to do that, I want to also change it in having way more female quants than any other hedge fund out there. So thank you very much for listening to my story. Thank you very much, Karen. I totally did not get in my joke about your prime minister, who, by the way, likes women, too. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Um, you would like to answer some questions, yeah, wouldn't you? I'm happy yeah. to so answer please, questions, yes. If you would. Either, actually, could you please come down here just so we can get them for the recording, if you would, please? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I would like to know if you tried any like uh, control strategies, as in, for example, discriminating on the birthday of the CEO. Yeah, I have not. Um, data is the problem. I've also gotten a lot of people want to know if I've looked at it by race of the CEO, which I have not been able to get a data set for that. I haven't looked at the birth date. That's an interesting one. Um, James looked at, what was it that he did? He looked at things about having to do with their incoming reason. 
So if they, uh, or if the previous CEO had been fired or if they retired or died or things like that, and if the incoming CEO, if that changed it, he also looked whether or not um, CEOs who were coming from internally versus CEOs who were coming from externally. So irregardless for gender, if somebody is promoted from within versus um, hired from outside. That one actually showed that people internally did better than externally, but there's there's a lot of data in that Eventvestor data set that can be sifted through, and I haven't done it. Uh, age would be an interesting one, too. No, I didn't mean age, just like birthday, something completely irrelevant. Like uh, what, which month they were born yeah, in? Yeah, which month they were born yeah, in. I have not done that. So you, which month they were born in? I figured that'd be easy to find. That one I probably have the data for. I'd have to think about how to structure that, but that would be an interesting one if it's something completely irrelevant to gender. Yeah, that'd be interesting. I'll have to think about that one. Buying for CEOs who were born in, you know, there's that whole theory about people who are born, what is it, uh, people who are born in the fall do better in life because they're bigger their whole lives and so they can like beat up on everyone else in their grade and they're always superior. Isn't that the like Malcolm Gladwell theory? And so he, he, his study has to do with Canadian hockey players. And it has to, the hockey players that are born in the fall do better in life because they're bigger their whole lives and so they can beat up other people. I don't know if that's true, but that, that maybe I invest in people in the fall versus the spring. That's an interesting idea. Have you thought of putting any delays on the buys and the sells? Because I think one of the common things that people bandy about is that companies will bring female CEOs when they're poorly performing. Yeah in order to take the flack for unpopular decisions, then fire them, bring in a male CEO to reap all the benefits of layoffs and restructuring and things yep, like that. Yep, I haven't heard that one. I have, I've heard that idea that, that companies bring in women when they're poorly performing. Generally, it's pitched to me as your strategy is doing well because they bring in the women when they're doing badly and so there's greater upside. I haven't been able to arbitrage that one out. I've also heard the idea that companies, just about before they're going to make a CEO change, they release all their really bad news to drive the stock price down so that then they can bring in the new CEO and be like, we're fixing it, we're fixing it, and hope that they'll get a bump from that. But I haven't been able to, like, that's an, an interesting theory as well that somebody, it was actually the first time I ever shared this at one of our meetups with our uh, community, at the very end of the night, someone was like, are you sure this has anything to do with gender and isn't just CEO changes? That the interesting thing here is the fact that the CEO change is happening. And I think that, you know, I made the joke about the fact that the price goes down after a CEO announcement and there's a 20-day uh, window there. I don't actually know if that's a bigger or smaller or different for women CEOs versus men CEOs. I expect there's an opportunity there for investment uh, investing based on either change, because change, the, the market gets nervous about that. Um, and I expect if you did something where you tie the change into, if it's an external CEO, you'd have really interesting things there. But there's so much, in so many different ways to look at it, I haven't gotten into all of them. Anything else? Okay, let's thank Karen again for this great talk. <laughs> <laughs>